The parables of Jesus are some of the most important teachings in the Bible. Rich, rich teaching. The parable of the soil. So Jesus decided to tell us. So you know, Lord gives many parables. So let's listen carefully and prayerfully and reverently. As people are getting settled, if you want to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 16, we are continuing from last week. We're in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Uh, it's a continuation of last week and what Jesus is doing in revealing this sharp contrast between one individual's life and another individual's life. We've already kind of set the, the stage, and as I read the parable once again, hopefully those details you will be reminded of as we continue to journey through this parable. We kind of ended at those cliffhanger moments. It's this, we understand who this person is, and we understand who this person is. One person being the rich man, the other person being Lazarus. We understand their eternal destiny, that Lazarus ended up in heaven, and the rich man ended up in hell, in torment. And we understand what is taking place, but then it stops. We didn't get to the point of the parable. We didn't get to, well, what happens next? We didn't get to the final conclusion of this episode in Jesus' life as he tells this story. Those of you that took notes last week and those of you that are starting to take notes this week, the title was High Def Divergence. What does it mean to have such sharp contrast and it have be so vivid? That it is as vivid as high definition. It is, it is ultra defining in how and how these two people lived such diverse lives. I just want to get right into it, starting in verse 19. Um, the story will be familiar. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died, and he was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame." But Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. As we look at this story, the great contrast, we talked about that there's imagery just going through. Jesus is a master storyteller and he is really getting his audience to get involved in this story. He talks about a gate and he talks about the distance being far away and he talks about a great chasm between the two, between the rich man and between Lazarus. We talked about the reality of their clothing and the reality of their house and the reality of their situation. And what we ended with is this, that in that great chasm, the righteous and the unrighteous do not mix. What Abraham says to the rich man as he's looking at him from heaven is he says, you had an opportunity in your life to understand, and then he says specifically from Moses and the prophets, this whole movement of what eternity would look like. 
You see, how we respond in this life is decisive for where we reside in the next. We cannot wait until eternity, as the rich man is trying to do, to make our relationship right with God. The time is now. As we get involved in the story, that's where we ended. And I want to remind us of what Jesus' point is in telling about life through parables before we get kind of to the, the crescendo of the story. You see, the parables of Jesus are not just a collection of quaint stories disconnected from mission. It's not like old great-grandpa that you go to his house because you love to hear his stories, but when you go to his house and you hear his stories, none of them are connected. It's like this and this and this. They're fun. They're great. They're entertaining. They're joyful. You love to watch him tell it, but you're like, man, I have no idea where that went. You see, Jesus is telling stories. Jesus is telling stories that are intriguing, that are full of life, that engage that real life right now Middle Eastern mindset. And so as we engage, we have to engage in it, but they're not disconnected. We have spent somewhere in the range of 25 or so weeks talking about parables. We have many more yet to come, and they are connected. They have a very specific aim, and that aim is to give understanding to the kingdom of God. A question that I could insert here is in the last 25 weeks, because we have been going through the parables, do you have a deeper understanding of the kingdom of God? Has God nurtured your heart? Has Jesus refined you? Have you moved more closely to his agenda? You see, at the age of 30, Jesus begins his ministry, and he begins his ministry with this phrase that we get to read about in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. This is what Jesus says. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. When you read that section of scripture, right before Matthew chapter 4 is the time where Satan engages Jesus in trying to lure him, tempt him away from, guess what? His mission, from what God had set as the agenda that this is what Jesus would be doing on this earth. Right after Jesus has fasted for 40 days and right after he has engaged in tremendous and serious spiritual warfare, right after that moment, this is what Jesus declares is his aim. And as he speaks the parables, he says, this is my mission, repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. Here I am, the God of the universe in the form of man, Jesus. It's a stark contrast to what we would assume the world would look like. It is a stark contrast between Lazarus' end of his life and the rich man's end of his life. What we learned through the parables and what we learned through Jesus' awesome storytelling is this. God is a good and gracious King. If the, the aim of Jesus' ministry is to declare an understanding of the kingdom of God, then guess what? The kingdom of God has a king, and that king is in fact God, and God is good and gracious. We have read story after story after story of Jesus proclaiming the goodness and the graciousness of God. We learned that in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 8, when we talked about the friend at midnight that needed food for his friend that had shown up, that God gives generously. If this guy who didn't want to be disturbed at first eventually gets out of bed and gives the guy bread so the guy will shut up and so he can go back to sleep, isn't our God so much bigger and better than that? We learned about the graciousness and the goodness of our God compared to that story that Jesus told we also learned that God goes to great lengths to seek and to save that which is lost. In Luke chapter 15, we talked about the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. What does it mean to follow after a God who seeks 
after you, who knows you, who understands you, who looks at a world of seven billion people and knows their names, knows their life, knows what's going on in their world. We know that God is good and gracious because we have learned through Jesus' masterful storytelling that he is patient in judgment. He's not destroying good when evil is present. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and the separation of the good wheat and the tares that, 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 uh, that look like wheat that clothe themselves and looking fake. And so the people that are tending to the field, they're not exactly sure, is this wheat or is this tear? And so the farmer, the smart, wise farmer says, let both of them grow alongside each other. When the time comes, then we will separate. God is good. God is gracious. He interacts as a good and faithful king. We don't only learned in Jesus' storytelling that God is a good and gracious king, but we also learned that in this kingdom, there are those who follow and live out their allegiance. If we go back to the story of Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus shows, identifies some sort of faith. We talked about it last week that he wasn't complaining. He wasn't grumbling. His life was described as all of these things, a, a man who is clothed in sores, a man who cannot get away from the dogs who are licking his sores, and yet there's no mention of him complaining in this life. And after this life, he finds himself sitting in heaven, being cared for. The high def contrast is in that story we have Lazarus, but we also have the rich man. The rich man in this life had everything he could ever imagine or want. He had the best of food, the best of wine, the best of house, the best of clothes, the best of relationships as he picked and chose who would be part of his grandiose parties. And yet in his death, the only mention of what was taking place was misery and pain, and a deep conviction that he got it wrong. Sharp contrast, but we learn that there are those in the kingdom of God who follow after Jesus with all allegiance. We learned in several parables that people who follow hard after Jesus are willing to remove anything that stands in the way of devoted discipleship. Remember the pearl? I still have that pearl on my dresser. The pearl of great price spoke about in Matthew chapter 13 verses 45 through 46 is a relationship with Jesus of such value that you'll sell everything that you have so that you can know and understand the faithfulness of this good and awesome and sovereign and magnificent king. If we are to be obedient followers of Jesus, if our allegiance are to show that we are part of this kingdom that is the aim to be understood, then we need to be active in engaging God in prayer through bold, blazon intercession. It's the same parable about the friend at midnight. You've already wrote the reference down, Luke 11, 5 through 8. Do you stand there knocking? Do you stand there saying, this must be done? Do you stand there knowing that if a neighbor who's annoyed that you're trying to get food at midnight comes and answers the door, will you be so bold as to approach God who has declared, I listen to my people, I hear their prayers. Will you stand before him and will you continually, boldly, brazenly pray that people will come to know him as their king? Is that part of your routine? Is that part of your experience? What does your prayer life look like and does it show your allegiance to this aim of the kingdom of heaven? We also know that if we are to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus, we will understand the strength of life transformation. Even if at first it seems insignificant. Remember the parable of the mustard seed? The smallest of all seeds, this little tiny thing that can grow into this massive bush, 
Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32 speak of this parable. Maybe you look at your life, maybe you look at your situation, maybe you look at the reality of what's going on around you and you say to yourself, this is so insignificant. Who am I? What am I doing? Why am I here? Why should I even bother to mention the name of Jesus with people who do not know him? It just doesn't seem like it matters. And what Jesus speaks to us is, oh, it matters. It is of great significance that your life being transformed by the power of the gospel can move a person to ask questions, can move a person to look at your life, and can move a person that has Lazarus's experience after death or a rich man's experience after death. What does it mean to be transformed? We also know that those of us who make a decision to follow Christ, we are committed to a life of obedience. Not consumed by self, but caring and understanding of those around us. Guess what parable that is? The parable that we're in right now. What does it mean to live an obedient life? What does it mean to not be consumed by ourselves? What does it mean to care for those around us or on the contrary, to not care for those around us? God is king. He is in charge. His agenda will prevail. If you grew up in the church, if you grew up in the culture and the tradition of church, we don't do a lot of culturally traditional things here at Second Mile. You would know this Sunday as Palm Sunday. You can read about Palm Sunday just a couple pages over in Luke chapter 19, verse 28, and you can read through that story. It's when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem and the people are absolutely ready to declare Jesus as king. You must be the Messiah. And they quote from Psalm 118, and they say, hallelujah, you are the Messiah. You have come to save us. And they throw down palm branches as he enters in on a donkey, and they put their robes in front because what they want to usher in is another great exodus. The children of Israel had been slaves from Egypt. They had been in captivity for such a long time. And then God, with all grandiose, miraculous, absolute power, descends upon the people of Israel and frees them from the slavery of Egypt. And the people had been wanting that to happen under the tyranny of Rome. And here is Jesus, and he matches with some of the stuff in the Old Testament. And there's this guy named John the Baptist, and he's declaring, guess what? The Messiah is coming. My whole purpose in life is to announce that the Messiah is here. And then Jesus comes and says, repent. The kingdom of God is here. But you see, people in that day, people who really understood the Old Testament, or maybe they thought they really understood the Old Testament, just antiquated the fact that, hey, this new king, he is, in fact, from the line of David. That same triumphant kingdom that David had established, we are going to be part of that. And so they were waiting for Jesus to conquer the Roman Empire. Enter Palm Sunday. But see, at the end of that week, on Friday, all they see of Jesus is a bloody, beaten, doesn't even look like a human because of the torture that he has undergone. And so Pilate is standing in front of the crowd and he says to the crowd, this man, I just, I cannot be responsible for what's about to take place. And they don't remember their words the previous Sunday. What they see in their minds is a failure of a king. And so they say, give us Barabbas, crucify him. Has God failed you? Has he not met your expectations? You see, the rich man is now in torment forever and he realizes, I missed it. I missed my opportunity, and he's begging for any sort of relief. 
what he says to Abraham in heaven is, okay, if you can't give me a drink, if there's this great chasm that has been put in front of us, if I cannot find any relief, then please, please, please do this one thing for me. I have family. I have five brothers. Send Lazarus. Again, he's getting this all wrong. It's like Lazarus is the man. Lazarus is the one that can, that can convince my brothers that they need to change their life. Send Lazarus because if they see the reality of someone being risen from the dead, then my brothers in all of their selfishness, in all of their un- inability to understand what's going on around them, maybe that will catch them and shake them to the core enough to realize that their brother is dead. And that he's living eternally separated from Jesus. Abraham, if you can't give me a drink, if Lazarus can't touch my tongue with his finger, then send him to my brothers. Abraham's response is somewhat shocking. It's somewhat unnerving. It kind of makes us say, why is this the way Jesus chose to tell the story, verse 29, but Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. What the rich man is saying to Abraham is, hey, the Moses and the prophets did nothing for me. I had that available to me too, and and I didn't see it. So something bigger, something more grandiose, something has to rattle their cage. Luke chapter 11, verses 29 through 30. Speak of the truth that Abraham replies back towards the rich man. Abraham's reply is this, they have enough in front of them to know the truth. And in Luke chapter 11, verses 29 through 30, when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. What Jesus is saying as he's telling this story is you don't need any more proof. I'm right here. I'm right in front of you. I'm having this conversation with those of you that are listening that are skeptical that I am the Messiah. You demand and demand and demand proof, and yet the proof is right in front of you. You see, what's interesting about knowing and understanding the life of Jesus, knowing and understanding the circumstances that that followed him and went before him, is the problem is not individuals need to witness a miracle. The problem is their own unwillingness to hear the word of God. Maybe that's where you find yourself. You're like, if God would just prove himself to me, if it would just be so blatant that I would have no other reason to question, if literally the skies would open up and Jesus would directly, personally, with all kinds of grandeur, talk to me, then maybe I would be able to follow him with everything that I am. But what Jesus brings Abraham into the story to say is, hey, it's not that you need a miracle. What you need, what you need to become aware of, what you need to solve is your own unwillingness to hear the word of God. You see, you and I maybe know this, or at least we've heard it before. Evidence does not necessarily lead to belief. That happens in our everyday lives 
a long time ago, I'm not gonna get super involved in this story because I don't wanna waste time in it, but a motorcycle hit me in my car. It was obviously his fault. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a motorcycle and you're okay and he was okay and I got out of the car and I'm like, what were you thinking? He's like, I don't have insurance and I'm on my way to a court right now and, 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 just, I'll, and I'm like, oh, I'm taking all your information. I took all of his information and very long story short, he did have insurance and, and I had all this stuff that I had gathered together and nothing happened. He got off and my insurance had to pay and that was the way it is. You see, evidence doesn't necessarily get people to believe the truth. There's all kinds of evidence around the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. But what's interesting about this story that Jesus is telling, the truth is Jesus had already raised a man from the dead. In Luke chapter 7, verses 14 and 15, before this event happens where the crowds have gathered, where Jesus is telling this story, then he came up and touched the bier and the bearer stood still and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him to his mother. You see, Jesus is standing before a skeptical crowd and he's telling the story and what he's, what he's telling to them is, I've heard it, I've heard it murmuring through the crowds, I just need proof. And Jesus is saying, you already have proof. I'm already here. You don't need someone coming back from the dead. The fact of the matter is someone has already come back from the dead and you still don't believe. And if you didn't believe the first time, well, guess not what? You're not gonna believe the second time, which Jesus does again. Jesus would raise another man, actually named Lazarus from the dead. In Luke chapter 11, verses 41 through 43, Guess what? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Not only had he healed a young man and gave him back to his mother, not only did he resurrect Lazarus, an actual person named Lazarus from the dead, well, guess what we're about to celebrate next weekend? Jesus himself conquered death. How much more proof do we need? What Abraham responds to the rich man is, you don't need more miracles. You need to believe the truth that's right in front of your face the word of God. Did any of these events lead to everyone's belief? Ask yourself that question. The answer is sadly no. Not everyone who stood around Jesus and watched him show up after his death, after he had been bludgeoned and mutilated, there were still people that doubted. There's all sorts of conspiracy theories that you can read about, about how this man could have maybe possibly survived. It's not about evidence. It's about our heart's willingness to believe the truth of Scripture. To see God's work and to hear the Spirit's voice, the heart must be open and the eyes must be looking for the truth that is Jesus. I know there are those in this room that are still wavering, they're still wondering, they're still trying to be convinced, is this really worth giving my life to? And Jesus' response is, if you want to know that it's worth it, don't just look around you and see, well, how does the world show the magnificence of God? Although the world does show the magnificence of God, it says, read this book. Take in the truth that are found in these pages. Fall in love with the story that is being told about a declaration of a kingdom of God that is coming, a kingdom of God that arrived with Jesus, a kingdom of God that has been established, that continues to be established, a kingdom of God that one day Jesus will return again and restore creation to its proper place. Yes, there's sin, and yes, there's death, and yes, there's pain, but there is a mission that is bigger and greater than all of those things, and it centers around the person of Jesus.
the rich man says to Abraham, but I didn't repent. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither Abraham responds, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. You see, the summary of this parable, as we kind of pull it all back together, is this. The rich should examine how they use their wealth and the source of their affections. Jesus is speaking to a crowd that has used their influence to get what they want, but ignored many of their people. And so Jesus is speaking into that moment as the rich man is the one that meets a fate that is not desirable. The second point that we understand from this parable is that there are no second chances after death. That death is final and that your eternity is secured based on the decisions that you make in this life. The third summary of this parable is this, the story of God through his word, the law, the prophets, the completed Old and New Testament is affirmed in revealing God's will for humanity. If you want to know Jesus, get to know the Bible. And the last thing that we learn from this parable is this. Signs, miracles, in and of themselves are of no value if the heart is not right. Jesus is speaking to our heart. Our head will follow. There is evidence. We don't believe in something that is just so ridiculously insane that it has no proof. No, Christianity has proof. Jesus is a real life person. There are hundreds and thousands of years of good, solid foundation that shows that what God is doing in revealing himself through his son Jesus is true and is right and is beneficial for the transformation of humankind. Colossians chapter 3 verses 9 through 11 says this, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But Christ is all and in all. You see, what you have to come up against is the reality of Jesus. And in this next week, will you be a person that was celebrating Jesus on Sunday and condemning him to death on Friday because your expectation didn't work out in how Jesus would meet your needs? Jesus has come to establish himself in his mission and he wants you to join his mission. What we get to celebrate next weekend is, is the resurrection, is the unbelievable, miraculous event that Jesus conquered death and he conquered the, the, the need for us to be separated from God. You and I have an opportunity to embrace freedom, to repent and know that Jesus is in fact our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord, a reason to celebrate. My challenge for you as you continue to look through this parable is to be really, 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 really honest with yourself. Are you still trying to hunt for proof? Or are you actually just seeing the reality of the revealed Savior that is in his word? God is good. God is gracious. God is establishing his kingdom. Jesus has been talking about it all throughout the stories of parable after parable after parable. And what we learn from Jesus establishing his kingdom is those who follow Jesus in the establishment of his kingdom move this way, act this way, think this way, live this way. And so are you ready to do that? 
Are you ready to be excited about your faith? Are you ready to tell people about this tremendous person that we know as Jesus, who, not, who is not only a person, but is the God of the universe? Are we ready to celebrate? Are we ready to laugh and be filled with joy and to know that we have purpose beyond ourselves and that purpose is to bring glory to the best of all heavenly fathers?